Good morning, Hello. everyone. Uh, thank you for being part of uh, Entrepreneur India's uh, Resilience uh, Series. Uh, today's topic of uh, discussion is electric vehicles, the uh, green way. I'm Saurabh Kumar, editor of Special Projects, Entrepreneur India, uh, the moderator for the session. Uh, let me quickly uh, lay down the ground rule for our attendees today. Uh, so the discussion will go on for around 30 minutes, and this will be followed by a 15 minutes uh, Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions during the course of the discussion, you can post them through the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen if you're on Zoom. If you're watching us live on Facebook, you can post your, uh, your questions in the comment section. Uh, mention in your question if it's directed uh, uh, towards any specific panelist, and we'll take up the questions for the panel discussion. So uh, I'll quickly introduce our panelists for the day today, and we have with us Mr. Akash Gupta, CEO and co-founder, Trip Electric Mobility. Uh, Mr. Anand uh, Ayadurai, co-founder and CEO of Vogo. Uh, Mr. Rajinder Balaraman, Director Matrix Partners, India Advisors. Welcome everyone and thank you for uh, agreeing to be part of uh, today's uh, discussion. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the world, the world including India has been talking about moving to EVs for a while now, but India's uptake has been slow. Uh, there was a plan to, uh, you know, only have EVs by 2030, but that seems a little stretched now. So we'll go on to the policy part later since it's a resilient series. So I would want to first know, uh, you know, for, from you, for our audience to know uh, that how has been the experience for you during the COVID and what were the challenges and learnings uh, uh, that, uh, that came up to you? So if I can start with Akash. Sure. Hi, everyone. And uh, thanks uh, for calling me uh, Entrepreneur India. Thanks, Saurabh. Uh, hello to the co, you know, uh, panelists here. Uh, so EV, uh, you know, for us is uh, like a two-year-old, uh, two-and-a-half-year-old journey. I would go a little bit back behind, you know, COVID to see that what are the key challenges uh, that, that we face to establish, you know, uh, ourselves in an EV uh, kind of an ecosystem. We've got about 1,000-odd vehicles right now, which are all electric. And, uh, and uh, primarily, we as Zip Electric focus on last mile deliveries. But yes, uh, doing EVs uh, and, and early on, we, we realized that we had to work on getting the right, uh, you know, assets on ground because uh, the Indian terrain is very different versus the foreign terrain. So while US or China would have seen kick scooters, India, you cannot last a quick uh, kick scooter ride on the roads uh, after a day uh, because the roads are so, you know, bad in shape uh, or our infra is not that supportive. So we had to build uh, the right kind of vehicles that can ply on the Indian roads and then also last for two to three years at least to make business sense out of it. So that's one. Second is uh, the batteries had to be really worked upon in terms of whether we use lead acid, lithium, iron, lithium phosphate. So we worked a lot on the battery side that, uh, that you know, how do you charge them? How do you swap them? What is the right, you know, technology to use for that? So we tried to work a lot on that uh, over the last two years. Also in terms of tracking, in terms of telematics, in terms of, uh, you know, getting users hooked on to an EV is not very easy because there's always a range anxiety. If someone wants to ride 100 kilometers, he would always think twice before taking an electric scooter because, uh, because uh, you know, there's always a battery element here and there are not enough fuel stations where you can just go and, you know, uh, take a load on and ride another few kilometers. So that's been, I would say, a little bit of our background journey to solve some of these challenges. Uh, and and I'm, I sh I'm sure that we can go deeper into it as we go along through this conversation. But COVID, I think, uh, per se, uh, gave, uh, since you asked about that question, so it gave a bunch of challenges to a lot of businesses, not just EV, but essentially how to, you know, give users... Uh, uh, the confidence of delivering the vehicle, uh, the the riders to ride an EV because we do mostly last mile delivery. So how to you know uh, put a lot of load for a big basket or an Amazon and then do deliveries. So those were things that uh, that were very interesting. But I think there the biggest uh, support that a startup could have gotten and thankfully we were lucky enough to get that was that we my team you know from day one of COVID they said that we are standing on ground. We will serve any customer who comes on the way. And I think that was the most resilient part that that a startup had to show that the team who, which is on ground, who's managing operations was standing tall and saying that we are sanitized. Don't worry. We will ensure that, you know, uh, whatever kind of customer comes, we will give them a good experience. Mm -hmm. So that's what Zip has been trying to do. Yeah. 
and i also believe that given that you work with uh, by, you know uh, 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 people who 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 were into delivering essentials at that point in time so i think it was more required for you to be on ground and to be uh, ready i would believe right very very important yeah, yeah i mean we we actually garnered a lot of customers who were in delhi and cr who wanted to deliver to customers homes they were looking for a partner we you know stepped up and we said that whether it's an easy day or a modern bazaar or you know a small store who wants to deliver to the customers we would serve them and that's how you know we actually you know quadrupled our sales during that time i would say but it's all because uh, the timing was right and we were you know wanting to deliver essentials on evs and and yes that paved some good way for for the business i would say uh, for zip especially okay anand i'll come to you so uh, uh, how has been the ride for you starting march and till now uh, like how have you been you have to unmute me please so you can hear me yeah my man yeah, yeah. So, uh, quickly some background about uh, how our business operates and then get into how uh, how covid has impacted us right mm-hmm. Uh, so the last two years, we've grown from a few hundred vehicles to almost twenty thousand vehicles. We are present primarily in Bangalore and Hyderabad, and our primary offering to customers pre-COVID was uh, our system of scooters, which are present all across the city, where you can go and pick up that scooter and drop it at a different point in the city. So it's a self-drive scoop moped rental business in that sense. Uh, we had a few hundred electric vehicles as well, which we are scaling up, which were typically. high speed electric scooters which give a performance similar to a honda activa or a tvs jupiter right and that's what we are running for on the electric front uh post covid uh, we have actually uh, seen two three things that have changed in the business and we went back and we relooked at the product portfolio so part one is that we started to see that customers uh, so the best solution for anybody to go from point a to point b is that beyond owning your own vehicle it is to rent a vehicle from us because the next set of solutions typically require you to have either a driver or a co passenger with you whether it is public transport whether it's a car whether it's an auto bike taxi whatever other solution is there right uh, so this is the next best solution for customers but uh, we still felt that customers wanted to keep the vehicle with them for a longer time so we launched a product called gogo keep which is a product by which you can keep the vehicle scooter with you from anywhere from one day to 60 days right and what that lets you do is that you don't need to think about has somebody else used this vehicle this day right uh, the second thing that we started doing is we started sanitizing before every ride uh, and after every ride because we saw that that something customers really cared about and we started putting time stamps on when the vehicle was last sanitized so that people could see that the vehicle was sanitized at a particular point in time right uh, the third piece of the puzzle is that uh, people post that over the last few months are not necessarily willing to step out and come pick up a scooter right uh, you might have to walk a few hundred meters to come pick up a scooter and then take it back you may not have an immediate need right uh, so the third thing we started doing is to offer home delivery where a customer can basically ask for a vehicle to be delivered to him at his home uh, this is for anything beyond 7 days in terms of uh, a booking so that uh, the customer actually sees it right and Uh, and we also sanitize the vehicle in front of the customer, whether he's picking it up at the pickup point or even at his home, so that as a customer you know that this vehicle has been sanitized and it's not something which is you know in an Excel sheet somewhere or in an app somewhere, right? So broadly, we saw these three things, and in our minds, what we are seeing is that more and more customers want to keep the vehicle with them for longer periods of time. Use cases uh, are more around essential services and essential travel. So even during the lockdown, even in April and May. we continue to operate because uh, we were providing vehicles to delivery executives at that point who were either delivering uh, groceries food or medicine right and so that was a large chunk of our business then post may we are seeing that more and more customers it's beyond the essential services it's also customers within the city wanting to go from point a to point b but we are seeing both of these opportunities now which is the last mile delivery opportunity as well as uh, customers wanting to go for office for shopping for anything leisure oriented from point a to point b right so that's how we sort of uh, dealt with covid these are two three things that we have changed from the product portfolio perspective from the sanitization perspective and also just starting to give customers more and more comfort that this is a safe product that you can go from point a to point b oh. so that would have meant anand that you you required more manpower and uh, expenses to manage to, when you do the home delivery yeah. and sanitization and all 
So how did you work that out? I mean, in terms so, of uh, the you know, interesting thing is that earlier we were primarily an on-demand business, which means that you had to acquire uh, three to four customers per vehicle per day because there are different four customers using the vehicle on a daily basis. Now that we are seeing that more vehicles are going for longer periods of time, in some sense we are handling lesser uh, customers, right? Because right. One customer, instead of having you know twenty customers for a vehicle over one week, we have one customer for a vehicle over one week, which means that the overall maintenance required for that vehicle, the amount of time you are spending on maintenance, the amount of effort you are spending on maintaining that vehicle, is significantly mm-hmm. lower than before. So actually, we have seen that we have manpower now at every station or every location that we have. There is one manpower which is there on a one shift basis, but the other effort that we had, which was around maintenance of the vehicle on a more regular basis, those have actually come. It's not that it's something utilized. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Uh, so, Rajinder, uh, I'll come to you. You uh, made six, you know, you, you, as you mentioned, that you have three, at least three investments in uh, the EV space. So, uh, what has been your, how have you been reading this space? Especially, as, uh, what, what I would want to point out is that during the lockout, we experienced in bigger cities at least, that what a clean environment could be, what a pollution-free environment could be. And we all know that in bigger cities, at least maybe it's not more, but one third of the pollution is through vehicular, uh, is vehicular pollution. So, you know, uh, do you think that people would uh, want to use more, uh, EV, would wa- want to see more EV solutions and that would make you excited about the space more? Sure. I mean, you know, starting at a very, very high level, I think the, you know, Indian manufacturing story uh, is really one that is intertwined with the Indian automotive sector story. Uh, The automotive sector, if you think about, you know, the contribution to overall manufacturing, it's almost 40 to 50% of Indian manufacturing is actually related to the automotive industry. And this includes, you know, across SMEs, OEMs, parts, global exports, etc. So in some ways, India's uh, uh, you know future as an industrial power is somewhere linked to you know the automotive industry. We're already seeing globally that the automotive industry has actually uh, rapidly started moving towards electric vehicles. And so for us as a fund, when we took kind of a five-year, ten-year call, and we are long-term investors, you know it was very clear to us that you know the EV tran- transformation will happen. Question is always when. Uh, but EV transformation in India will happen and it it, will happen in India more manufacturing led rather than consumer pull first. Um, Because remember that the consumer in India is incredibly price conscious. So, uh, uh, you know, for them to actually, you know, pay, pay whatever extra amount they may want to pay, uh, you know, it, it will take them time, right? They're very, they're very capex sensitive or outflow sensitive. Uh, so that means that there's a lot, lot of business model innovation that is required. Obviously, Vogo is uh, a company that we're proud to be partners with. Uh, significant business model innovation on, you know, shared mobility and how do you actually bring the cost of, you know, that ride, you know, EV ride experience down for consumers. Uh, so, so that's a very clear business model innovation. Similarly, uh, Ola Electric, there's, you know, a lot of work that's uh, uh, going on on, you know, just innovating around the infrastructure and the business model around that, as well as, you know, the form factor and the business models around that. And then there's a third investment we have, which is more on the e-rickshaw side. Again, a lot of business model innovation. So frankly, I think the supply-led story here is going to be more important than the consumer pull backwards. Um, and the supply-led, not just in terms of OEMs, but also companies such as these three, which are innovating in terms of business model. And of course, Akash and his team as well, uh, who are innovating around the business model and actually bringing EV supply into the market. So I think that's where the, you know, uh, story is really going to take off. Why will customers, you know, pull uh, something? I think it's a good question to ask. I think in Vogo's case, it's very easy because, you know, the cost of, uh, you know, experiencing that, you know, EV ride is very, very low. But in other segments, actually, the customer is going to pull this because of some version of, you know, total cost of ownership, right? So if you can, if you can combine the fact that, you know, I'm not only better for the environment, but I'm also cheaper. Uh, I think it's almost a no-brainer. Uh, every customer would want to move overnight. And I think there are some segments in you know the market where that is already true. The total cost of ownership is already lower. Um, and you know the green uh, uh, slash environmentally friendly argument is already evident. Um, 
that's what prompted us to frankly make you know these bets in the market uh, in in vogo's case i think the simple logic is that you know there are multiple you know uh, uh, you know opportunities to basically sweat the asset more uh, which makes the total cost of ownership come down in akash's company's case they are doing deliveries which basically again sweats the asset more so the cost of you know deliveries comes down uh, in in oyriksha they are you know a shared mobility solution so again doing both mobility ability and delivery so again sweats the asset more and bring the cost of delivery down so if you can combine the tco story as well as the green story i think you know there's enough pull um but if you expecting consumers to pay a significant amount up front over and above you know what a nice engine costs frankly you know that story is going to take much longer so i i i was reading a report right uh, just in the morning and kurni report so it says that uh, you know with fame to and then on top of that the Uh, the the reduction given by the uh, the state governments actually the cost of evs might uh, uh, you know it, it, it becomes lower than uh, uh, the ice vehicles but the problem again again uh, which we were talking about is that uh, who goes for it i mean where where does it start does, does it start at the infrastructure level or does it start at the oem level so you say that it's the oem level but parallelly i think the infrastructure story in terms of charging and all needs to also play out and do you think there is a role that uh, startups can play there uh, in terms of creating some, you know unique business model that will uh, spur this uh, development um sure I'll, i'll share my view i think startups are perfectly capable of delivering and creating the digital infrastructure but there's a lot of physical infrastructure that's required here as well right so right. i think that's a, that's a pretty tall order and a tall ask I think if you look at OEMs, honestly, and again, I don't want to speak for OEMs, but if I think you know, OEMs have just gone through BS6 upgradation, right? I mean, right. that's like a multi-dollar uh, yeah. investment that you know all OEMs have made. Mm. So I, I struggle to understand how OEMs can be expected to you know invest again to actually enable this transformation towards EV, either on the infrastructure side or even just frankly on the technology side. Uh, uh, you know. It, all of these bs6 investments have to be you know recovered over the next 5 to 7 years at least uh maybe even longer uh, so that does create a window of opportunity um there are some startups who can actually step in and you know innovate and create better you know uh, products uh, you know over the next 5 to 10 years and there are some who are um the digital infrastructure i think you know whether it's the tech ip whether it's the you know uh, swapping infrastructure standards whether it's the you know payments layer whether it's the uh, bms layer any any of the ip areas i think there's a lot that you know that startups can do uh, and as far as the physical infrastructure is concerned honestly i think yes they can but it does require a lot of partnership with government um, because uh, uh, you know the government thankfully in some you know cities and states has announced you know meaningful uh, you know subsidies and partnerships but it's not nationwide right and so uh, i think there's a lot of uh, uh, you know that's lot that still needs to happen and and honestly also longer term you know there needs to be just a consistent you know uh, policy around evs for the long term uh, because no company whether an oem or a startup or you know investors like ourselves are comfortable with you know policies that keep you know changing over you know every you know one or two years right because these investments are made with a 5 10 year horizon so i think the government is working towards that there is a policy that you know is is being framed and we we are you know massive supporters of you know any policy that comes out that promotes the ev industry i think there are uh, ways that india can leapfrog uh, and you know lead uh, you know in the automotive industry globally there are only two or three geographies globally where you know uh, you know this technology exists and india has always been a leader in the automotive industry you know the auto component industry we should certainly not lose the opportunity with the transformation towards ev yeah I'm sure the the OEMs definitely have shown a lot of uh, courage uh, when they were asked to switch directly from uh, four to six. So you know they have made those investments and even uh, you know. But, so uh, you know, Akash, I'll come to you. So so as Rajendra was mentioning that you know the the the, uh, the policies that are there, obviously there is same, but the other policies are very you no know, area specific. So you started. with a full electric uh, do you think that if a robust infrastructure with which allows 
intercity uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know transportation also would you think that some that's something that would interest you as well in terms of logistics so see i think uh, for a mass adoption of evs uh, what is uh, right now required is to first get the consumers like you and i to start adopting evs right that's the first thing and then we can go to intercity i think within the city if you are able to commute on an electric vehicle then i think you start building confidence that oh this ev there's no pollution there's no sound it's it's so smooth i'm able to cover the miles that i want to do on an ev and i think that's how the confidence would start building and then people can adopt um you know bigger vehicles or intercity vehicles so my point on that is that two wheelers make a lot of sense where you can at least taste the youth uh, you know the youth via the personal mobility route like vogos um, like vogos doing and and you know via the the huge delivery executive fleet who whom we are you know putting uh, and converting to shift to an ev to sit on the vehicle and do the deliveries i think those are two very big segments that we are talking about and what and and as you were just discussing there's a lot of role that startups can play in this whether it's setting up the charging infrastructure whether it's setting up the swapping infrastructure which is very very critical to give that convenience and that recall you know mind recall for the user that oh i'm sorted i'm not going to be stranded anywhere and 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 these startups i mean uh, like like we we were you know about an year year and a half we dribbled a lot on the personal mobility side by giving monthly weekly plans and the first thing for the ev adoption which came forward to build a successful customer experience was to ensure that we have battery swapping stations until unless we didn't have battery swapping evs could not fly because because every now and then in the first month when we you know tried to do longer ride plans people were were getting stuck um, just even if they were charging they, they didn't know how to properly charge the ba- battery swaps were available we were giving them charges to take homes but i think it was a journey that we slowly learned and then we set up a lot of charging stations uh, you know at kirana stores at you know parking stations at hubs of our you know logistics partners to give that you know seamless experience and to actually work out whether we can also serve uh, and ride that scooter in fact what interestingly i would give a very small example of mine since i wanted to ride a zip only i ensure that i got a plug point uh, you know placed at my you know ground floor uh, you know connected to my you know electricity meter uh, and and a lot of cars also now like mg um, you know and others they have third party agencies or or an ether is also doing that whenever there's someone who's booking a vehicle they will first you know do a recce that the charging station can be or a plug point can be placed there you know with their uh, sub meter so that you know they equip these guys and i think that is one of the initial uh things that we are seeing for ev adoption and and the way that these this word of mouth spreads that more and more people are liking it more and more people are moving towards it and it's making a lot of economical sense um you know for for a, for an individual or a business so business we are very sure i mean we are saving about 20% um you know costs for every delivery for all the partners whom we are serving which is a huge cost at scale right and if we are able to multifold uh, this for a lot of you know partners that it makes a lot of sense and ev is not far in this category and i think on the personal mobility i i mean um you know it it would be in a similar way that's what i think okay. so i think for you uh, you know you you started with uh, you know non electric vehicles but then you have set yourself a target i believe of 10% of your fleet to be uh, something so why this uh, shift i mean what 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 is the what was the you know Games that you saw in this, uh, you know, in this transition. Correct. See, I think uh, I think like Rajinder and Akash have pointed out, right? Uh, electric mobility has been, in some sense, a chicken egg question, right? Uh, if it is a consumer, then it can be a final end consumer is using for personal use, or a consumer is using for commercial use, like delivery. Uh, that's one part of the equation. The second part of the equation is fleet operators like me and Akash. the third part of the equation is the ecosystem is there a charging and a swapping ecosystem which can enable either the consumers or the fleet operators to operate on operate and essentially make uh, actually build scale right uh, what we are uh, seeing today is obviously uh, like rajinder said that from a consumer perspective right even with the delhi ev policy which has actually in my in my mind is actually significantly game changing and the recent morph notification which talks about selling a vehicle without a battery i think what has happened is that 
the difference between an i7 and ev vehicle has become much much closer than it was literally one month back right uh, so as a result of change uh, being able to send the vehicle without a battery a high speed electric scooter which is similar to an activa right which is at close to 1 to 1.1 lakhs right let's say 1 lakh for example now the battery component is 25000 right so that has now become 75000 rupees the road tax and the registration fees are not applicable in delhi and a few other states right that brings it down to 70000 and here i'm already including claim subsidy you go and add additional 7 8 to 10000 for the uh, specific additional subsidy for high speed scooters right uh, which is for 1.5 to 2 kilowatt hour you now have a vehicle which is somewhere between 60 to 70000 landed pricing right and this will actually meet most of the specs across say fame and if if you are off in terms of specifications at maximum it is 80000 right so what you are now getting is a vehicle which is extremely close in terms of pricing just on an upfront basis right so in my mind some of the developments over the last month have made electric two wheeler significantly more attractive to everybody across the ecosystem whether it is consumer commercial or fleet operator and i would not say this six months to one year back right because for me at that point in time there was a significant price difference and the diff- that that pri- upfront price difference had to be made up by uh, me running these scooters over a much longer period of time than i would run potentially a gasoline scooter right so to me that is very game changing but at the end of the day if you think from a personal consumer use right a personal consumer is unlikely to pay more than even 500000 rupees higher than what he is used to uh, paying for a regular gasoline scooter right because it's about upfront cost is not about this so i think the ban- the difference between the ev and the i scooter has now become sub 10000 in my head but that 10000 has to become more and more compressed and become a sub 1000 sub 2000 kind of number for consumers to really shift purchase from a regular activa kind of vehicle to a electric vehicle right so then it boils down to two kind of people who can essentially buy one is people like us who want to buy it for commercial usage because we don't think about upfront cost we think about how much is the cost per kilometer over the life of the vehicle right so for us the consideration has been that can i pay 50% extra upfront so that i can recover that money over maybe one and a half years versus it takes me more time for a gasoline vehicle right which is a very long term bet that we have to take that bet has become significantly simpler for us over the last few months right with more or more of these subsidies coming in in place it makes it much more attractive for us to take larger bets on electric vehicles than it was a year back right uh, and to me the biggest change has been the ability to sort of buy a vehicle without a battery and additional subsidies that states are adding and the third part is the entire removal of the entire piece around road tax and registration fees right so to me this structural change is what uh, means that a lot more companies will move electric at least in our space significantly faster than they would have uh, earlier or they would have planned for a year back that move is going to happen significantly faster uh, as a result of some of these moves uh, from an ecosystem and swapping and charging i think uh, again that has the same chicken egg problem right is it going to be players like us who have to develop this across the city is it going to be the government is the government going to give people grants like delhi has done to set it up at residential and commercial cases i think uh, the easier way to sort of build something like that out is to have a uh, ecosystem which does not necessarily depend on infrastructure being built right which means that it is either home charging or home swapping if it is a consumer use case or it is central swapping if it is a uh, if it is a commercial kind of use case because building infrastructure means that you take a goal which is potentially 3 years out and make it a 5 year 10 year goal because that creates one more bottleneck for Uh, electric to become mainstream and it's not that there aren't enough bottlenecks right so mm. you have to eliminate bottlenecks rather than add additional bottlenecks so our view is that the ecosystem should develop in a way that you people don't need need to make significant capital expenditure up front to create you can't say that i have to spend hundreds of crores to create infrastructure and then people will start buying vehicles right because that never happens uh, nobody in the ecosystem has an incentive to spend a large amount of money up front Uh, and then wait for results over a long period of time right it it makes sense to create a home based charging swapping infrastructure or a central swapping infrastructure if you are commercial uh, and then uh, sort of uh, make it attractive for people to start buying vehicles rather than create obstacles so i think the direction that the policies are going in terms of subsidy the direction that in terms of being able to sell the vehicle with a better we are we are actually moving very significantly in the right direction this year and i see that A lot more people will start 
entering the electric space uh, in the coming few months and the coming couple of years then would have maybe a year or so back because i think it's become commercially more and more attractive as the government starts to incentivize it further right and i believe that once delhi has started doing it more states will start to do it in a much more aggressive way right for me for example this delhi ev policy means that i would launch uh, delhi significantly ahead of what i would have originally planned right so if i was planning to do that a year or two down the line i might do it later this year or early next year versus doing it in the 2020 2023 kind of scenario because it has now become attractive for us to actually launch it right so So that's I so, so, we, uh, so we will I will get to ride a Vogo bike by the end of this year in Delhi. You mean? Yes. Okay. So uh, you know you talked about uh, you know incentive for obviously for private players it won't be but as a federal system I think the government without any incentive and hundred crore thousand crore whatever it is if it takes to spur the development I believe that they can do the investment and they can take on this uh, responsibility and I'm sure uh, with the kind of uh, Pollution problems that we everyone every year is uh, uh, you know uh, fighting with. So I think that will that only be just a step away from uh, government taking the decision. I think that I'll come to you with a question that you know now that you know Anand very accurately and elaborately put it that why it makes more sense to enter this space and be here. And now he you know he's he's also uh, kind of uh, uh, planning. to launch in more cities much ahead because of these policies so do you think there is space for a lot many more players who can come in and do this or if it is there so will it be only on the on the commute side or will will there be more people on the uh, you know manufacturing and those kind like you said that uh, you know all the digital part of it can be done by startup so do you think that uh, there is more space for uh, others as well you know frankly there are uh... there is space across uh, you know multiple slices of this market uh, but the you know biggest challenge is that this is going to be capital intensive uh, right. if you're thinking of going down the manufacturing you know path of actually building an automobile company uh, you know bear in mind that you know there are companies which have you know decades of experience in this space or some startups which have you know 3 to 5 maybe 10 years of experience in this space who have you know built a significant amount of ip as well as have very deep understanding of supply chain and auto you know manufacturing components uh, the automotive global supply chain as well so there is a you know there is a learning cost there is a it is capital intensive and so this isn't a game for the faint hearted for sure uh, if you're thinking of you know purely tech plays i think there are you know bets that one could uh, you know possibly take and you know there are other investors on this call happy to collaborate with some of them i i i think uh, you know there will be the existing oems uh, uh, will definitely want to make a shift towards uh, you know evs as well and many of them actually just lack the ip and i think they will possibly acquire ip uh, to kind of kick start their you know growth uh, on this uh, uh, you know journey and so companies that are building you know pure ip bets um, uh, i think there will be a very active market for you know uh, you know acquisitions down the road um, both in india and globally uh, whether you choose to go down that path that's a separate discussion um, but i i know that there are some bets which are just pure ip bets that can get developed if you're thinking you know building a pure automotive company whether focused on you know the two wheeler segment the four wheeler segment or the commercial vehicle segment i do think that there are you know bets that can happen but like i said significant you know capital that will be required honestly i think uh, bets that we have taken are actually the mobility bets uh we think you know obviously shared mobility is the future of mobility um across multiple form factors and i think each of the mobility companies that come to own their respective segment of the market i think will find fantastic opportunities to integrate backwards because uh, they actually uh, have the network they have the data uh they know exactly uh, uh how to set up the you know infrastructure uh, uh how to sweat that infrastructure to you know get to profitability sooner and how to overcome that chicken and egg problem faster than any other company going after this uh so we've taken a mobility first view of this and we therefore invested in you know multiple exciting companies in the space each of them going after a very different form factor different customer segment very different use case very deep markets in each of their cases and 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 our conviction is that the mobility companies will in many ways be best positioned to actually integrate backwards and build out and win this market okay okay 
so uh, 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 you know here's my one of my very favorite question whenever i talk to anyone about evs is that how clean actually are evs so uh, electricity for say you know i know that uh, you know it's very clean when we drive it in the cities but electricity per se is produced primarily by coal in india so what we're doing is basically moving pollution from out of the city to a particular place somewhere uh, you know outside uh, if your city limits and everything but still is that so uh, so uh, uh, akash do you think that uh, you know you 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 are completely electric driven so do you think has the question come across your mind that actually what are we doing are we just put, you know putting the pollution out of the city to uh, the countryside and do we need because we have uh, obviously we have plans for uh, renewable sources of, 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 of uh, that we have set for ourselves in india but that's far away and i don't know how much we are going to achieve that so what's your view there very interesting uh, perspective uh, uh, sort of uh, see i think uh, um uh, i mean what we've seen during the world of uh, this this last four months during covid is that we've, we've seen um, you know aqi levels to be uh, dropped to um, you know thresholds which we had never imagined we were all talking about aqi levels at 300 200 but when it when everyone was in a lockdown and everyone was sitting at homes and and work was happening i think uh, it it was a guiding light that you know we could see the greenery around us i i saw those posts where people were seeing yeah, eiffel towers sitting in the gurgaon you know buildings right so i think that is the world that we all want to live in and and there's there's no um, you know perfect way to get that right i mean we can't stop living we can't stop traveling wherever there will be requirements people would do that but the intent of uh, you know uh, doing it in a way that it doesn't affect us um, you know and we can't solve everything today so from that perspective when when we started 3 years back i mean our focus was to do only sustainable um, you know means of commute and and that was one of the missions that you know uh, zip stands by that whatever we'll do we'll we'll want to do in the best possible way but in the most sustainable way right uh, so so looking at ev now see these batteries while they get charged through electricity but compare uh, i think we need to compare a fueled uh, you know uh, the, the kind of pollution that the fuel vehicles are creating and at what cost versus what an ev has been able to do over the life of you know 3 years or 4 years that a battery can last see what we've seen there so definitely you get a 40% cost saving um you know on the tco so per 100 km you spend about you know 4 dollars on a petrol vehicle versus a 2 and a half dollars on an ev that's a, that's a good saving to start with right and and india being a very affordable you know and a cost saving market this this really works at scale second is you know you're not uh, uh, the the fuel that you're saving so every minute that an ev is been ridden we are saving around 70 grams of co2 uh you know to be emitted versus a two wheeler uh, you know which is which is driven on petrol versus an ev 70 grams of carbon um you know co2 which is being uh, which is coming from a you know fueled vehicle it's going down if it's on an ev the good part on ev side which is also there that after 3 years of that battery life there are you know uh, uh, there are reuse uh, possibilities of these batteries there are repurposing startups there are battery you know uh, battery life can be extended or it can be put into different applications like a solar application or you know uh, the the telecom applications so i think those are things that we feel are are a lot right in the current scheme of things and there are a lot of new innovations and ips coming to ensure that how this can be further um, you know brought down whether it's uh, you know hydrogen based cells or you know uh, uh, nickel cobalt based cells there are a lot of innovations which are happening uh, across the globe and the idea is to keep moving that and not sit down today uh, to wait for the you know uh, bus to be fully ready but being startups i think one thing that we need to take a call on is start riding i mean we have to continue ride uh, continue the ride and then keep tagging along people who make the right sense for us and and build the business model more stronger or the you know mission more stronger that's my take on it before i ask anand to respond to this i'll request my attendees again if you have questions keep them coming we'll start taking the questions
in a couple of minutes. So Anand, come to you. So you know the same question uh, to you as well that you know uh, the, the 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 clean mobility that we all talk about. So you have both. You have uh, ice racing, uh, ice based engines also. Uh, you know gasoline based engines also and electric. So when we talk about electric, we say that it's clean. But how clean exactly is it? What do you think? Correct. No, I think uh, Akash called out that we don't live in a perfect world, right? But the way I would think about this is that if you are talking about 15-20% uh, of all vehicles to be electric by say 2025 and maybe that's 50% in the next 10-15 years and so on and so forth, right? Uh, the source of electricity being coal is not going to remain true for the next 20 years. Uh, so, in my mind, if you are going to consume fuel, fuel is always going to be entirely from uh, hydrocarbons and from coal, right? Uh, but the composition of what electricity is coming from will change over a period of time. So, today, it does not seem like uh, like in the next two, three years that uh, electricity's contribution from coal is going to change very significantly. But over the next 5, 10, 15 years, what moving towards electric does is it puts us in a position to be there. So you're right that in some sense you're transferring the uh, AQI from maybe from average AQI across the country, you're pushing it away from cities towards smaller places if it first picks up in urban cities. Right? That's possible and I don't necessarily have the numbers off the top of my head. But what electric lets you do is that over a period of time it will become cleaner. right? Uh, it's, it's, it's always going to get better, it's not going to get worse. right? And I think uh, that's what... Uh, will make the difference over a longer period of time because you're not talking about suddenly taking every vehicle in, which is on fuel and converting it to electric tomorrow. We are talking about doing it over a five, ten year period or maybe over the next 20 to 30 years, right? By that period in time, where electricity comes from can fundamentally change, but where fuel or gasoline comes from will not change. So, in my mind, that's the reason to actually start making these moves and in parallel, obviously, figure out what's the packet behind electricity in the first place and make that cleaner, right? So, Okay. Okay. So we'll start taking questions, and you know, I hope that the uh, the lobbies like OPEC and all uh, allow uh, renewable energy to become a reality uh, very soon uh, rather than later. Uh, obviously, we have seen a lot of uh, companies also, uh, oil and gas companies also, uh, you know, in investing in renewable uh, uh, renewable energy. So hopefully, everyone's under understanding the value. So. We have a question here from uh, Arjun Madra. He says that what is the future of uh, e-rickshaws under L5 category? So Rajinder, I'll give this question to you because you have investment in one of the e-rickshaw companies. So he, he, he wants to know, Arjun wants to know, what's the future of this uh, uh, segment? Actually, the segment is doing really well. Uh, I was also surprised when you know I first met this company that we're investors in now, e-rickshaw. Uh, I had uh, maybe traveled by an e-rickshaw maybe once or twice in my life and I always thought it was, you know, kind of a novelty, right? Ki, you know, kahi chota, matlab, share mein, matlab, milta types. But then I kind of, you know, opened my eyes and I thought, actually, you know, these things are all over like urban India and especially in, you know, north of, uh, you know, Maharashtra and further north, right? Maybe not in the southern states, but they're actually everywhere and my eyes were actually close to them. Uh, I just didn't see them on the streets because I wasn't looking at them. Uh, but they're actually everywhere. Uh, I think there are almost a million uh, e-rickshaws on the roads. Um, and uh, the category is actually growing at strong double digits uh, year on year, even 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 through this crisis, right? So uh, it, it's actually surprising. Uh, the reasons for, you know, why it's growing is also straightforward. Actually, uh, two things. One is the consumer is upgrading from pedal rickshaws. So if you remember in, again, you know, most of North India, like, you know, there were always these pedal rickshaws which people would cycle and you know carry two three passengers at the back and you know there's a very large base of that right and it, this is really you know kind of the bottom of the you know pyramid in terms of you know mobility solutions where you know maybe the consumer is paying 10 rupees uh, that consumer and that driver is actually upgrading up to a e-rickshaw which is a 15 20 rupee price point to you know generally speaking um, then there is the auto rickshaw consumer who's actually coming down the auto rickshaw consumer, there's a meaningful base of auto rickshaws also in the country. Uh, that consumer is coming down because typically auto rickshaws are used, you know, in a short commute kind of a distance, right? And uh, your auto rickshaws today cost 30, 40 rupees, you know, in most cities for that short commute. So if you can actually take an e-rickshaw for 15, 20 rupees, you know, you're saving 15 bucks a ride. Uh, and we know that there are enough people in the country who are time rich, money poor. So even if you end up spending, you know, call it 10 minutes more, 
uh, or five minutes more, why would you, you know, pay fifteen bucks more, right? Um, so I think there's a pull from the pedal rickshaw up. There's a pull from the auto rickshaw down. I think it plays in a very different customer segment from, you know, where Anand uh, plays and uh, you know, or where Vogo plays and where you know Ola plays. I think very different customer segments. Uh, and frankly, that's the next you know customer segment that is coming online and looking for an intelligent mobility solution, which you know provides some degree of you know assurance that you know there will be I will get to the train station on time or I will go to the market on time. Uh, there will be someone who will be there to pick me up, and it will be at a price point where I don't have to haggle and I don't have to you know kind of compete. So I think there are multiple enablers for this market to you know a keep continue to grow and b get digitized and come online. Um, and uh, uh, frankly, it's a segment which uh, uh, is quite uh, under the radar and growing fast, and we're excited. So exactly as you said, that is under the radar. So you know, do you think that it it needs to come in the radar because uh, we don't we need regulations? Uh, do we do you think we need regulations around e rickshaws also so that we make it a very uh, proper legitimate business? Because uh, I don't know if you are uh, I mean which part of like at least here. In Delhi, some parts of Noida and everything, you know, it's a kind of a menace when you look at these auto rickshaws flying on the on the road. It's all over, and you know, it's not regulated. They do not have proper stands where they can pick up and you know stop for uh, you know for, for for people to get down and all. So, do you think that we need to put a little bit of focus on because this is a growing segment, so we should have regulations around it? Yeah, no, I, I you know, in general, I'm. I'm a fan of regulation that enables rather than an a regulation that uh, obviously you know, helps, yeah. right. Yeah. What what would enable this industry is I think first and foremost let us uh, you know recognize that it is an industry. Um, it is also the largest electric you know kind of fleet uh, uh, or asset class in the country today. Uh, yeah. It is significantly impacting and positively impacting the environment in you know the regions that uh, you know it does operate and. I think the government does, at least the Delhi government has clearly announced policies around e-rickshaws, so they recognize the category exists. No. Uh, I think the, yeah, so I mean, at least some governments clearly recognize that it, you know, it is a, you know, a vehicle compactor that, you know, promotes the environment, is good for consumers, uh, given price point, etc. So I think there are, you know, I think what you are asking for is, you know, should we create you know, the same version of auto stands and taxi stands and, you know, more licensing, more regulation. Honestly, I'm not sure exactly what we would achieve through that. Uh, if it is for consumer welfare and consumer safety, then yes, I think companies like Oyeriksha, you know, definitely, uh, uh, you know, do a lot of work on empaneling drivers to make sure that they are, you know, verified drivers, etc. And, you know, especially in times like this are adhering right. to you know, safety standards. Uh, but if it is about uh, you know trying to you know create one more you know license raj where we say only only so many licenses will be given out each year, I think that's frankly you know anti-consumer and anti anti uh, uh, EV industry. Point taken, point taken. Uh, so we have another question. This is from Parveer. Uh, he wants to know that uh, with the Delhi policy and other states uh, following. Uh, uh, what are the main benefits that uh, an EV startup uh, will get from the, uh, from these? Uh, I think that to some extent Anand has answered, but I'll uh, again uh, put, the, put it to you, Akash. That what do you think are the are the benefits that have come from fame and other state policies that encourage you to be in the space, or whoever wants to come in the space would be encouraged. I think the uh, the biggest uh, enabler uh, these policies give to a to a nascent ecosystem like EVs, which is which is I would say a sunrise industry starting to you know kick off and get off the block, is one. There's there's a lot of confidence that it builds in the entire ecosystem that if if there are policies made for it, if there's so much effort that government is doing, uh, then then it makes a lot more sense for younger startups to jump into different pieces of the puzzle because nothing is fully solved right now, whether it's the OEM piece, whether it's the battery piece, as Rajinder was saying that whether it's the, you know, BMS, whether it's, you know, uh, the telematics, there are a lot of scopes, you know, into different scheme of things that, that can be solved while, you know, the nation is building towards going electric, right? Uh, at the same time, what I see as a, as a uh, light of uh, uh, light at the end of tunnel for us is, is the focus on, 
the logistics segment to 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 go 100% electric by 2025 as as you know delhi ev policy mentioned or by 2023 about 50% of all the logistics companies to go electric i think that's that's something that's the mission that we are on you know to see how the entire logistics segment can move to electric and that makes a lot of sense for companies right uh, because there's cost saving there's sustainability and what else you are looking for if if you are are at a large scale you know doing millions of deliveries a day so so those are things that and along with that one of the very interesting elements which which uh, the policy mentioned was the scrap um, you know value of the product right which which we've not talked about because that enables a lot of easier financing options right so we we have uh, the fleet which is all owned by um, you know a third party so we have hnis or you know investors who buy these vehicles and then we lease them out from them now they were always looking for a buyback option now if these policies come along where where there's a buyback to be done by the government of the scrap value of the vehicle i think that enables a lot more confidence in financing and today bank financing is not that easy for an ev but i think with with policies like this that also you know is not far away right uh, at scale so those are some green uh, and brownie points that i saw along with the subsidies which are which are very well carved out from 5000 to 30000 right so so it's it's a well placed policy i think other other cities and states should try and adopt some of those uh, you know variants which have come out in the recent policies and that will only scale up um, you know the ev mission that the country is on and right from you know niti ayog or prime minister every, everybody has been supporting that okay sorry uh but, but i think that there is a question uh, i will uh, read it out to you i would really want you to help this uh, person called suraj prajapati he says that being a student we do not have link to the angel investor vc can you help us to to get so i mean that's a very straight but i would want to know so if someone starting out in the ev space as a as a as a as a entrepreneur as a startup so what should be the way one should uh, you know look at uh, you know getting investment from from uh, maybe an angel investor and maybe you see funding whatever so what would you advise uh, what would you advise this startup uh, uh, you know uh, aspiring startup for i i would uh, recommend people put together a very very well thought through presentation and a very well written email uh, <laughs> and then bet on uh, you know that you know well thought through presentation and email getting the attention of an investor um see the truth is that uh, uh, you know investors is there a, is there a, is there a, is there a garbage solution that one should adopt while writing a mail to you that you know you I, will i don't think there is any you, i don't think there is any magic solution just for you know everyone whoever's on this call i mean i'm happy sharing i you know i am a graduate of uh, you know very good uh, you know ivy league business school but i got my current job with a cold email right um, you know I, i i wrote to you know avnish who founded matrix india it was a cold email it was a well written email i explained to him why i wanted to do what i wanted to i wrote a very nice resume uh, and you know he gets hundreds of these emails i'm sure he you know you know does not answer each i mean answers each of them actually apni personally actually does uh, but he he probably does not take more than you know 5% of those meetings and i have my job today basis that right uh, but it's the same right we will if, if we don't see enough thought that's gone into that you know well written email or that presentation which explains what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing uh frankly it's not we, we are also being judicious about how we spend our time ideally we would like to spend at least uh, 50 to 70% of our time helping founders that we work with build you know large and successful companies because that's what you know uh, uh, allows us to be in business uh, uh, and that's what keeps the flywheel you know kind of going uh, but we do spend significant time meeting new founders as well but you know if, if you haven't put the effort into you know clearly enunciate your thoughts you know we're not going to invest half an hour one hour uh, uh, if your email is a really poorly written email okay, okay. sorry you, to be very blunt on this one no that, that's hope. perfectly fine yeah that answers so akash do you think the the the, big, the biggest hurdle is to cross the first round as in the angel or seed fund or is it the, uh, or the game becomes challenging when you when you have to talk to rajinder and the others at matrix partner <laughs> good question but see i, I think uh, every round uh, uh, obviously the first round is not the easiest one because uh, for at least the first time founders but you know you need to as you keep growing your battles become bigger and your expectations you know are also 
you know in that sense uh, different uh, so so i think uh, it's it's not about the round per se or it's not about you know the 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 male or the uh, the struggle but i think it's about uh, it's about doing the right thing at the end of the day if, if you believe so so like a suraj who's writing you know this question i would say that jump into it i think you will figure out uh, uh, you know enough and more people who can back you if you have the passion and the you know vision to build something and uh, i mean i did my corporate world for 11 years and then i left it all to start up you know this venture and i was always you know the biggest fear for me is that if i fail uh, what will happen right uh, i mean the the fear of losing it uh, all was was the one thing but then once you take a call on it it just jump into the bandwagon and then uh, you know journey startup is always um, you know not perfect on day one you figure out your journey you figure out uh, you know your pivots and then you build the right business model so so those chances you need to take but you need to be a part of this um, you know uh, uh, gut call that you need to take that yes i have to do it you will learn how to send the email you will learn maybe how to build the pitch decks uh, from failures but that's what a startup journey is all about Uh, so we just uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. So we'll just take one more question that has come for uh, Anand. Anand, uh, what wants to know that uh, you know post COVID, uh, you know people uh, will prefer to have their own vehicles more than vehicles which are being used. But uh, so, what do you think about it? So I think the question is that you know people will be more comfortable in owning the vehicle rather than. But as you said that your your program for longer period that. that you would give the uh, uh, bike to uh, either scooter to someone has worked yeah so i think the reason why our company and mobc and a uh, bunch of these companies exist is because if you buy a vehicle then for 90 95% of the time it is sitting in your basement somewhere right because uh, it just lying there being unutilized and what companies like mogar mobc do is unlock that value right uh, the remaining 95% when the vehicle is standing there we give it to four customers during that same time right i think that's what we essentially create right um, what so you would be paying for two years of emi and you'll be purchasing a vehicle that is obviously the safest thing and you can do it but you are also spending a lot more money than you need to if you are going to drive only 10 or 20 kilometers a day right or lesser than that uh, what something like what is entire industry does is says that uh, you don't need to pay for what you use if you are going to use the vehicle for 1% of the day pay for 1% of the day right you don't use it for one hour pay for one hour right what we are seeing and this is more covid specific is that people are more comfortable instead of paying for the one hour to pay for one day they might use still for four hours right they might take for seven days and use for two days but they are more comfortable doing that today but at the end of the day still four times in a month that vehicle is getting used by four different customers you are not paying for 30 days and traveling for seven if you want to pay an emi of 2500 there is a rupees a month you might spend take seven days worth of bogo or, or like four different two day products from us and use it when you need to and maybe spend 1000 rupees so right and still the product is completely safe so i think that's the problem we are solving uh, what changes is the unit in a pre covid era you might have been comfortable with a 15 minute 30 minute ride now we are more comfortable with one day because one day or seven days tells you that the product is good i think that's what okay. all right Uh, this is when we have run out of time, so we'll have to close. But thank you again so much for uh, coming here and speaking to Entrepreneur India. It was uh, very insightful, uh, not only for me but for the audience also. And as you mentioned, that you know it's a step-by-step process for EVs to uh, become uh, a, a household thing, and hopefully it will happen. And hopefully, uh, Anand, I will see a Volvo by the end of this year in Delhi and uh, in other cities. So good, good luck, everyone, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.